old-fashioned ag science, hort science degrees, and, and as we all know, and, and the reason for me starting to pull that course guide together, um, you know, they're pretty much all gone. They really have pretty much all gone. I don't think that necessarily matters, because uh, we know from what John says, there's many wonderful pathways into this career. It doesn't have to be a horticulture degree. Uh, but we are still going to need people with those technical skills, that technical background. And there's many ways to do that. It could be a plant science degree. It could be an environmental science degree, a biotech or something. But for those 15-year-olds who are interested in food or nursery and plants, it's very, very hard for them to figure out through that university system, well, I can't study horticulture or agriculture anymore. I'd like to work in this field. How can I get in there? And so I guess uh, what in closing, I'd like to just implore you to look uh, beyond the business, you know, attracting people with those unusual business skills and that sort of thing. Don't forget the technical side that we still need, and that's the part of the supply chain mm -hmm. that I think feeds into so much of the exciting stories we hear, and yet there's a risk that, that, that this wonderful uh, Foundation for Industry Talent Initiative is, is going to sort of um, assume that the unis are going to take care of that. Believe me, I've been battling with this uh, information <laughs> approach with the, for the last couple of years. They don't give a monkey's. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Jared. I think, uh, you know, we're really conscious on the foundation for industry talent, but it is across the board, and certainly it does include what we call the traditional life sciences component of the produce industry. So it, I'd, I'd like to just change tack a bit, Tim, and I mean, you highlighted, and I saw your slides beforehand, and you highlighted it again today, you know, just, just how critical in uh, maintaining talent in a business, how critical supervisors and supervision <coughs> are. I mean, wh what is... Are there any easy answers there, or what do we do? I, I don't think there's too many easy answers to any of the problems in this world. But in, in particular, and, and, and the, uh, the Crop Life Survey um, bore that out, that poor supervision was the reason that 75% of the people left that the, uh, the survey participants. Now, that's just awful. Mm. That really is awful. Um, what makes a good supervisor? Well, I think it's probably much to makes a good parent. You've got to be consistent. You've got to be logical. You've got to listen. Um, it, it, it's no good saying you'll do it because I said, because people today aren't interested in in what I said. They're interested in why you said it. And uh, and and supervisors, especially the older ones of our vintage, um, uh, need to. Um, take a bit of a grip and, 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 and realise that the expectations of particularly younger people today are different. Yes. Uh, they do want to know why and they do want you to be consistent. Yeah. And that ties in, I suppose, Wukash, with the, the, the first question from Shane. A question of why do I have to start that early, maybe? You know, and saying, OK, we re need to think about re-engineering how we approach jobs. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's an opportunity to work backwards. I think... Uh, you know, in the early days of the industry, from, from my understanding, uh, cold chain wasn't effective. It, it didn't <coughs> exist or wasn't yeah. effective. Well, now we have um, sophisticated cold chain. We have modern technologies. So, so we don't, you know, we can afford to sort of let the business, you know, the industry lay idle for a few hours overnight as, you know, um, and allow people to sort of come to work at a more sort of humane hour, I believe. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Humane's a new way of describing it. Yes. Renee Hutchinson from One Harvest. Um, like I hear about it all the time, all industries are calling out for more labour, trying to get more skilled labour as well. And you both spoke about awareness in the industry and going into schools or going into unis. Just wondering how we compete as an industry with other, indus uh, as with other industries that have more government funding or more industry funding <coughs> to actually get the awareness out there. So what's your thoughts around that? So you mean how do we compete as far, like with in a monetary way or in yeah, like in a monetary way but also like rewarding that industry in terms of pay. Um, well I mean I, I still think that most people don't really understand what this industry is capable of and, and what different areas you can go into. Um, you know, there there I think there would be a, you know, some government assistance you would be able to get in um, promoting, you know, the uh, the industry as far as like to universities and things, but I think more so than what a whole bunch of money is going to do is you actually need to educate the people to let them know what we are actually doing, giving them examples of 
you know, some of these companies now that are getting into the IP and the, the new products and the special types of packaging. Um, and like Luke, uh, Luke has said before about working backwards. I mean, you ask somebody to name products from Kraft or someone from Nestle, and they'll tell you, you know, five or ten off the top of their head because they can associate the product and the brand with a company. In our industry, it's a lot more difficult because there are no names applied to anything. Um, that doesn't mean that nothing has actually had an advancement in the last 10 to 15 years, but it's a little, it's not as obvious to the public in general. Um, so I think if you can actually educate them to, to let them know that there are these opportunities, um, and you know, we're, the other good thing I think is that we're in the, the health food industry. I mean, it, I hate to think what people go through in tobacco or stuff like that because it's, you know, that's just, uh, you know, shooting yourself in the foot. Um, we're seen to be, you know, the next big thing in, in the world in, in helping the population grow and we need to use those, you know, those positive imagery, um, whether it comes down to, you know, more of the marketing side and, um, you know, PR, I think this, this industry is always, the only PR you'd ever get is bad PR. You only ever hear when the bad things happen. Um, we need to get some good PR out there of, of what people are actually capable of doing. Okay, we've got time for maybe one more. Sorry, I'll can I just yeah. also add to that? So just to answer Renee's question. Um, look, you're right, we don't have the money. I said earlier, I don't think we have the unity. So, but I, that's, that's where I alluded to, we have to take that leadership approach. Okay, they're not gonna come to us right now. Let's look for them. Let's look for them. And when we start bringing outside people in, well, then I hope there's a snowball effect. They'll bring the new ideas, you know, and all the solutions that will help elevate the industry, help elevate the profile, and then it will start looking more attractive because it will have that profile. I think we have to do the best with what we got. So, okay, we don't have budgets for huge, huge advertising campaigns, but instead of asking your friend if they want to work for you, putting that up on the coffee shop window at least as a start to just opening up that pool put a two-line ad in the paper, something to just expose yourself to something new, and then that will, I think, build on itself. So, Richard, last question, if that's okay. Last question. Uh, Richard Owen with the PMA in the States. I think all three of you mentioned you either have education or work experience uh, outside of the produce industry. Um, what industries do you think do a really good job of, of making their industry sexy, if you will, to attract people to be a part of it? And uh, Google doesn't qualify because it's such an anomaly. There's so few jobs <laughs> there that doesn't qualify. But what other industries do um, you think do a really good job of, of, of making it attractive to be a part of it? Uh, <laughs> look, I, I have to admit, I've, all of my experience is anecdotal in that area. I've only ever worked for small family businesses, no more than 20, 30 employees. So uh, I guess I use Google because they're the flagship. But I think... Uh, yeah, I, I'm limited, I guess, in not, you know, in our time to be there. So, so I'm over like, my, say, Macquarie. Yeah, you know, well, and I, yeah. yeah, I used to work um, for Macquarie Bank, and they're quite a, you know, very, you know, highly structured as far as you know in the corporate world. Um, they had, um, and I think it's, I actually touched on this in in my talk, um, but they have a lot of uh, clear pathways of where you can go within the industry and it's all laid out for you in your initial um, interview. They tell you, okay, well, this is where you'd be going into and you'd be there for so long. Then you progress to this department and then depending on what you like there, you can go on to you know, the next area. And it's very clear as to where you can end up in five to 10 years time. Uh, I don't <laughs> think that's something that is portrayed that well in our industry. Um, you know, when you come into the produce game, you, you're you generally in, in, you know, just one, whether you're in farming or whether you're in wholesale or whether you're in the retail, uh, I think it's not so clear to people as where they can actually take their skills to the next level because I don't think traditionally that's how it was done. It was, you know, we've always been quite a reactionary industry. It's, it's just a day-by-day -day basis and whatever happened, that's, you know, was your job for the day. Whereas you need to now start thinking five years down the track where you would like that company to be and including your staff. Um, you know, a lot more in-house training, um, you know, a lot more exposure. Um, I mean, this industry, you can go all over the world. There's so many different facets of, <coughs> of learning that, uh, you know, you can actually take. And that's one of the things that appealed to me. But when I started, I didn't know that. Um, 
I just saw it as selling fruit and veg. Whereas now I find myself traveling all over the world, whether it's seeing suppliers or, or customers. Um, and my friends are always really surprised because they think, well, don't you just sell fruit and veg? You know, what are you doing in America? Like that, you know, they, they, they're just not that aware. Um, so, I th- you know, as not just a corporate as such because they're, um, they can be quite restrictive, um, but anything that actually has, you know, clear ways of progression that people can actually see um, and they've got something to work towards and attain, I think that's appealing to anybody. Everyone likes to work to a goal, be rewarded, have that recognition come back to them when they take the next step. Jim? Yeah, I, I can only agree. Um, I go back to my statistics. Um, 16% of the sample uh, that I mentioned earlier on of why people left was um, limited career growth and um, lack of career path. Uh, people today want to know where they're going. You know, I, I can't think of too many industries um, that people are clamouring to get into other than law and medicine. Now, I don't know that um, law and medicine have particularly uh, good images and, and someone talks about banks, you know, well, everyone hates banks at the moment, <laughs> but lots of people want to get into them. So, um, I, I don't know, quite honestly, I do not know where we go, but we do have to improve the image of the industry and I think we do have to concentrate on science at schools because science is um, going backwards at a rate of knots and that's where so many of the people in the industry come from. If, if we don't have the opportunity to apply the science and, and there's some wonderful science, there's wonderful developments um, in the industry today, um, but we have to get that message through to the young people so they want to join us. Mm. Okay, so we'll have to finish it there unfortunately because I know there's more questions out there. It's just a couple of things I'd like to do. One is, uh, some of you may be aware that uh, PMA Australia New Zealand has, has sponsored through scholarships 10 university students to attend this conference. Uh, and they're drawn from a whole range of different universities, different faculties, different levels of where they're at in the university courses. I do want to recognise Emma Townsend because Emma's done a great job in coordinating that program on behalf of PMA Australia New Zealand. So thank you, Emma. And <laughs> Uh, and also, before I thank the, the three uh, speakers this morning, there is in your fo- the, in your folder there was a exhibition passport form. I'm told, and so there's a competition. If you get around, you get it stamped at each of the exhibitors, uh, handed in by two o'clock this afternoon because that's when the co- the thing will close and will be drawn. And you're in the running if you do get around with your exhibitor passport. Uh, you're in the running for a bottle of 2003 uh, Grange, so it's probably worth visiting all the stands. Uh, finally, and the most uh, uh, enjoyable part is to thank Tim, Summer and Wukash for the time they've put in, not just today, but in pre- preparing for today and stimulating the discussion uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, thank you, and if you can show your appreciation. <laughs>